So today we're talking about the resiliency of the TTRPG hobby and how this can be a wonderful, diverse community with all sorts of creators contributing their own ideas into helping us run the best games we can. And a part of the hobby's growth is the industry's growth and where the industry is viable and in other cases where it's had trouble in the past. And so part of what we're going to be discussing today is this interrelationship between the industry and how it actually affects your group at the table, different players that may be able to add a light to your games, um, and really making sure that we can keep playing the games we love for years and years to come. Does that so sound to, like a good... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And to, to kind of jump in, I want to frame some of at least how I feel about Dungeons and Dragons as it relates to its role within the, the industry. So Wizards of the Coast, D&D &D in general, is not going to be the company that revolutionizes tabletop role-playing games. Their position currently is to minimize risk and keep doing what they're doing. So just like uh, EA and Bioware and you know, other large video game companies. The the reason that you have many, many, many Call of Duties, you know, just like one every year or uh, new Assassin's Creeds or what have you is because it is risky to do something that is without an audience that you know is going to pick it up. So uh, if you think about even like, you know, fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons and the fact that it was not as successful as it should have been. The, the game was so drastically different than uh, 3.5 that it alienated a lot of the, the people who were interested in, uh, in, in playing it. So you think about Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, 2014, moving into 2024. If they kind of like, you know, flip the table again, a lot of us might be super excited, happy, wipe the slate clean. Many others, not so much. They've invested so much time, energy, financial into, you know, getting all the books and content. So they, they have to make this promise that, oh, yeah, no, it's backwards compatible. A dubious thing to uh, to promise and also to to execute on. So we're kind of at that halfway point. We're like, yeah, technically it's possible, but please don't do that. And when it comes to creating something new to get people excited don't expect that to be in D&D. Expect it to be all of us. And to that end, uh, we cannot deny the, the value of Dungeons & Dragons as it relates to being the largest part of the funnel for the TTRPG hobby, getting new players into the game and uh, just creating the excitement that, um, that you, you need to kind of inspire somebody to dig a little bit deeper. And, you know, then kind of learn about all these other new games, the, the ones that we would be creating. So I think that's, a, uh, I've said my piece basically on, on some of that. And I think we can kind of jump into, uh, maybe, did you want to talk more about D&D &D as an entry point? So my view is at the moment, I don't think the TTRPG industry is as resilient as a lot of creators would like it to be because D, D is such a monolith in the industry i all right i'm gonna go off on a complete tangent but I'll, I'll wrap it back don't you worry so so in my day job i'm a professional martial arts instructor which is a service-based business of specialized lessons and there's not like a product we sell that you take home and you do stuff with like in a lot of ways the instructors are the products and it is a fascinatingly low cost, potentially um, high revenue business, because really you only need like some kind of equipment, but it's the, it's the instructor, it's the relationships you create that actually drive the revenue. And I would never recommend someone to be a professional martial arts instructor for the money. Um, in a lot of ways, this is why I fell in love with TTRPGs is the amount of conceptual parallels between the martial arts industry and the TTRPG industry. You hear a lot of the same gripes. You see a lot of the same problems. And you also hear a lot of the same heartwarming success stories. Like I'm sure 
Michael, you've probably seen on Reddit, you know, a and d player or a TTRPG player was able to really like identify that maybe they needed to come out to their friends and family. And they used the game as practice to build the confidence to be able to do the scary real world thing. Um, which that's what martial arts is. We, we do all these goofy movements and stuff with the hope that if somebody were to attack us, we could successfully defend ourselves. Um, so in the same way, the where the martial arts industry collapses is if the business is too ego-based. If there's one instructor that knows all the knowledge and they have a little bit of helper instructors to kind of hold pads and stuff, if that lead instructor gets sick, the business can't open or function. A lot of my fear is, and not really fear, because I, I think there's a lot we can do to assuage this, is TTRPGs right now, in a large part, are dependent on Dungeons & Dragons. Um, th there's like some sales speculation that we could talk about, but I find the most, uh, from my background as like someone whose business is basically relationships, the biggest indicator is the diversity in D and D content creators that I don't see from other TTRPG creators. So, for example, when the 2023 OGL crisis happened, um, I was really contemplating switching to Pathfinder Second Edition. So I started going into Pathfinder communities and looking up Pathfinder YouTubers. And this is not to knock Pathfinder at all. Um, it was just my personal experience that as I was going through that content, I wasn't getting a lot of diverse voices. It was a lot of very similar messaging of, oh, the three action economy is brilliant. And oh man, it's so much fun doing the, the three action economy and the lineages or ancestries or what they call them Pathfinder are so customizable. But you know, when you think of D and D and the, and the biggest names, Treant Monk and Pack Tactics are specialists of mechanics. Whether you agree with them or not, that's what they their channel is built on. Ginny D is about social contracts and role playing, a very different vibe. Um, XP to level three, Jacob uh, does a combination of edutainment and skits, as well as some homebrew and some other things. So you have a greater chance of finding a voice that connects to what you love about the game if you listen to these content creators, the reason they don't really talk about other systems that much is because D and D is what drives the algorithm. So they're able to build their voice off the success of D and D as an identifiable brand. And I do think that another system could step into that place. And there's a lot of work that they'll have to do in order to get that to happen. Pathfinder had the opportunity to do that with 2023. But if you notice, we're not talking about how Pathfinder is the most amazing system. D and D, even having the one of the roughest, you know, public relations scandal last year, was able to still maintain being the top dog in the industry. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have some thoughts on that. Uh, but uh, in order to to get there, I'd like to ask you a quick question. Uh, what would happen? were D, D to disappear they say hey we're we're no longer going to be making any more games no longer going to be making any more content uh what's what's the next step in that process as you uh perceive it i can feel the comments that are gonna rip into me um, i have a lot of so, thoughts too so I'll, yeah. I'll be sure to share them and but yeah. uh so, so a few months ago, uh, Ben Riggs wrote a post called The Golden Age of TTRPGs Are Dead. And he got a lot of flack for that post, and he even apologized for it. Um, now, when I read that, the first thought I came to mind is, oh, Ben Riggs, the author of Slaying the Dragon, a history of Dungeons and Dragons from an industry perspective. And I didn't see a lot of commentary from his harshest critics that pointed to a lot of the historical research he did for that book. And that was really, if you think about it from his perspective, he has all of this background of, you know, the history of D&D, &D, but not everyone necessarily does. Um, what happened in the late 80s, early 90s, especially when Magic the Gathering and Elder Scrolls came out, was that there were a lot of people kind of jumped ship on TTRPGs for more accessible games. 
Um, and the industry almost kind of collapsed. <laughs> so, so define what that what that means, though. That means like TSR went bankrupt, which was okay. the company that owned Dungeons and Dragons. And we don't between the collapse of TSR, its acquisition by Wizards of the Coast, and the release of Third Edition SRD, we didn't really have another TTRPG rise and become as big as what D and D was. So at this specific moment, I feel like a similar thing would happen now. And that doesn't mean that we can't take action steps in order to ensure a more resilient industry. Okay, so we're going to get to the more the action steps because we both agree that that this is uh, has some some value for for creators like we, we all want our hobby to to stay around. However, the, the par- part that I would like to interject on is that I don't I don't know that if D and D were to close up shop tomorrow, that we would enter the same situation as TSR back in the uh, back in the day. And the reason for it is that we were so much more, um, I guess, independent of. Okay, so I, I guess the internet is is the big uh, big like defining factor here. So if Ginny D were to say like, you know what? going to make another game. I'm going to make a game by myself. I'm going to bring in, you know, some of these excellent content creators and we're just going to do the thing. It would be like, I would say wildly successful. This is something that she can do because there is a, a large following. Lots of uh, other content creators could do similar things. Uh, the the content creation venue that I think has the the largest chance of success to become uh, something greater than than what it is right now would probably be critical role for obvious reasons, but also dagger heart just as a system. Uh, so I, I don't know that things would fall over. I think it would take a little bit of time to find who the next thing is. But even thinking about all the content creators whose livelihoods depend on the the ability to create content, which is in part why OGL was such a big deal in the first place. It's you had a whole bunch of people creating third party material who were like, I need that to not happen because I, 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 this is what I do for a living. And um, that's part of why they got the backlash. But if they were to, to just close up shop, some other game would take their place. And it'd be the one that has the largest followers following currently being Critical Role and, and Daggerheart. Uh, there would be a subset very similar to how like Pathfinder has a subset of d and I think MCDM would be its own like thing over here. And I think that we would be split a little bit. I also think that it would create more opportunities for growth because right now we're kind of all overshadowed by Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and, but it's it's very difficult to deny the the value of that that open funnel at the top. So I, I just want to say I I don't want to come off as saying this is what would happen. I just that based on the research that Ben Riggs did and how he constructed his argument. I I find his argument reasonable to believe that that is a possible outcome, not the outcome. I also see yours as a possible outcome. Um, just to let you know, in Ben Riggs's book, that splintering is what he identified as why the industry collapsed, is it created a lot of little pockets, and people kind of stayed within their pocket and then had a hard time drawing new players into their pocket because it got so niche so and that you know as much as we can bash on D's design for being too broad that is why it's accessible to a lot of people it's why the mcu movies are so successful is that they're not the deepest movie they're a lot of them are kind of like cheap popcorn flicks but they look pretty and there's a lot of production and marketing behind them so uh, it's I think there is value in having um, a broad option, but I also think it's valuable to have a lot of smaller creators. And st- I, I just, I think it was Sean Merwin who was talking about on the Ghostfire podcast now, gaming pot. Uh, yeah, Ghostfire gaming them. podcast. Yeah. yeah well, right. I think it, it was the Ghostfire, the lore cast in particular. He was just saying that, um, you know, when we're talking about MCDM and DC20 and all these new systems coming out, they're competing against each other. Like, it's like, you know, MCDM was a $4 million backer kit, a lot of money, right? 
in 2022, Dungeons and Dragons made 150 million. You know, Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro is not competing against other TTRPGs. They're competing against Warner Brothers and Disney. It's like a different tier of play that they're yeah. that they're playing with. Um, and even when Pathfinder, there's arguments uh, on whether or not Pathfinder actually outsold Fourth Edition. That was definitely the story. Actually, Teo Sabadia uh, at Alpha Stream had an article about like, did it really? Eh. Um, even when it was supposedly outselling Fourth Edition, there's no way it was more popular than Fifth Edition in 2016. And how much Fifth Edition was selling in 2016 is a sliver of a fraction of how much it sold over its lifetime. Right. So, to in order to get that level of success, I truly believe that even if you're going to play a niche system, the the game master from more of like a social standpoint, game masters benefit from being skilled at demystifying what TTRPGs are. And well, I know you want to lead into that topic, but uh, what should should we have somebody or a an organization like D and D in the space? Like, is it is it actually healthy? I know there's like a like a trickle down, and we all benefit because of just the the sheer volume of people that it uh, appeals to. But I I'm asking myself now, and maybe this is the wrong time to do it, um, whether or not we should even be. Supporting, I mean, yes, support D&D and also supporting major organizations like Hasbro in general. And so when I think of critical role, they are very like there's there's a reason why so many people love them. And they're doing a, a like they do a lot of marketing in, in the same way that Dungeons and Dragons does, where they touch a lot of different venues and work you know, with uh, other uh, communities and that sort of thing uh, with, with charities and everything else. But they they aren't suits. They are people who love their community. And and that's part of the reason why there's just so they, they've got so much going for them. So part of me is like, if we got rid of D D or just Hasbro's relationship with it, I I would like to see the the industry focus more on the the people because the, the companies don't care about you. You're just a product uh, or rather a consumer for their product. Whereas uh, organizations that are a little bit smaller and grounded, they might, they might eventually get there. I think, you know, money is a funny way of corrupting uh, you know, even the, the best kind of people, but, but they're, they're not there now. So there's a little, little part of me that's just like, I really want critical role in Daggerheart to be successful and sweep, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and kind of shift our focus away from a massive corporation. Even though, again, the, the design team, Dungeons and Dragons, they shouldn't, you know, I, I don't want them to suffer because of that, but it's kind of a weird situation. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where I, I sit on this thought, but I, I wonder if that's why we're actually seeing so many videos talking about like, is it going to be the next D&D killer? Is because I think on some level, maybe we want that. We just kind of want something else to to step in. And maybe we want it for different reasons. Some people just don't like D&D or just think that they're doing the game wrong. Um, and in others, I feel like we could be better served as a community, as an industry, if if better people we're in kind of the, the pilot seat. So I actually don't want a fall of D and D. Um, it, you brought up the games industry or like the video game industry earlier. And I actually imagine, and I don't know how valid this is, but I imagine something like how we have three major console producers right now. We have Nintendo, we've got Microsoft, we've got Sony. Um, and right now, let's just call D and D Microsoft um, because it's kind of like the middle. <laughs> uh, whereas I could see something like Paizo, depending on how they do multimedia and stuff uh, being more like Sony and critical role or 
uh, Darrington or whatever they're calling themselves, uh, being more like Nintendo. So you actually have like three entry points based on where people want to come in from. So if you want kind of a middle of the road option, D&D is the one people recognize in terms of brand name. If you want something that's way more technical, you go to Pathfinder. If you want something that's really easy, family friendly, whatever, theoretically, you would go with Daggerheart. Um, I mean, I I downloaded Daggerheart's playtest packet. I kind of glazed over a little because <laughs> there's just a lot there. Um, but I do think there's a place for a rules light system having the same ubiquity that Dungeons and Dragons has. Okay. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. It's yeah, no, I think that's fair. And we're probably getting there anyway. Just by virtue of people making their own games and critical roles, uh, you know, just continued expansion. But let's let's go into the actual uh, meat, I guess, of um of how to create a hobby that is more resilient. I, I think that these kind of thoughts on creating a more resilient hobby um, are valuable, whether or not you agree with either of us or disagree with both of us. Like if let's say D&D goes away and the industry collapses, these are preparation steps to get ahead of it. If we really are in a completely different age because of the internet and because of how many more creators relative to there were operating in the late 80s, mid 90s, um, are able to kind of keep the ship going should D&D collapse. I still think that these are valid ways to increase the resiliency of the hobby, no matter where it's starting from. Um, so to me, like kind of like the martial arts school and how where we see growth, um, you have to start with the people that are already in it. Um, and I really find that the first step is to get more people to be game masters. Um, and that I think like how like quote unquote normies <laughs> look at TTRPGs as this weird alien thing. Um, a lot of people are intimidated by the idea of game mastering. Um, and yes, there's some more work you do than when you're a player. Um, but I also don't think it's as difficult as a lot of people make it sound. So I first think that I think that we should be finding ways to demystify how difficult it is to game master. So more players are willing to do it. And when you've got more people running games, well, now you've created more space for new players to find games that they want to play. I think that even D and D is trying to, to head that direction. So we, we talked about this last time, but just how the bastion system is intended to kind of give that sort of micro dose of uh, dungeon mastering to the, the people who are at the table. So, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, and the other side effect to that is I'm pretty sure this was a sales call with Hasbro where one of the execs talked about the fact that based on their survey results um, for collecting information on D&D players, um, about 10% of D&D players are also dungeon masters. And also that 10% is who buys things. <laughs> so players maybe will buy the player's handbook. Uh, maybe they'll buy the Xanathar's and Tasha's, the supplementary books. But it's really the game masters that will buy things like adventures and dungeon masters guides and monster manuals. Um, so the, the side effect of if you're looking at increasing the resiliency of the industry is if you have more game masters, you might have more people buying core products and more units being sold. Now, again, kind of like what we do at our martial arts school, uh, one of the dangers is if it's like a single ego-driven business and you have no one else that you're building up. Um, uh, let's, when that let's define real quick um, what you mean by ego-driven. Oh, ego-driven as in uh, a lot of martial arts schools what they'll do is they'll have a head instructor and that head instructor will in a lot of ways keep their uh, lower ranking instructors and students from achieving their ability. Um, so what ends up happening is should that leader step away without having raised other individuals to their level or as a teacher, ideally beyond, you want to 
teach your students to be even better than you were at that stage. Um, then, uh, then what happens is if you don't do that and you get removed, the, the business that you leave behind collapses. So in order to ensure resiliency, you kind of need to pass the torch to whoever the next uh, leadership team is going to be. And it's always, it's always better to have a team <laughs> to be able to hand off and prevent burnout and all that stuff rather than trying to do everything by yourself. Um, so the, the next step is for all these new game masters that are already invested in the hobby to learn how to make TTRPGs more approachable to uh, to new players that have no idea what's going on. Great example of this in my personal life is my grandma started listening to a lot of the content I was producing. And she's like, I, I never really would have thought about D&D before, but the way you made it sound, I want to give it a try. And I ended up uh, playing an ongoing game with my grandmother um, right up until she passed a few weeks ago. So even someone, and really all she needed to know is, there's a dice, roll it, add a number to it. <laughs> like we could handle like, you know, like spell slots or whatever else. Uh, another example I just watched a few years ago was we were at a family picnic and one of my mom's friends came up and asked what she was doing over the weekend. And she was all excited and she's like, we're going to play D and D. And the friend was just genuinely trying to figure out what that meant. <laughs> So it's like, what's the goal of the game? I've heard about it before. You know, do you win D and D? Like, so it's it was really it was interesting watching my mom trying to decode for her how it's collaborative storytelling and why it's so much fun. And the easier you can make it for people to understand, the less resistance there is going to be for trying it for themselves. So I, I've always kind of viewed tabletop role playing games in general as just hanging out and talking to your friends for a few hours there there's usually i mean if you have a game master um there needs to kind of be an understanding of who's driving that experience and but for the most part or i guess i driving and arbitrating you know to greater or lesser degrees depending on the, the system and the, the style of play blah blah, blah blah but uh at, at its core that's how I try to describe it to people. And I, I, I wonder if there's like a better analog to, to point to because even that description has not really been successful because there's like, okay, what do you do? Oh, do you need a, a board to, to play it? Do you need, you know, this other thing? And the answer to that is always like, well, maybe, <laughs> you know. But uh, how, how would you go about um, sort of getting the idea of what a CTRPG is across to uh, a totally fresh player. This, I, this is not a perfect description. Again, this is why this is, needs to be one of the action steps. Cause if I had it already figured out, that's what I'd be saying. Um, I, I think what I talk about is just, it's a storytelling game where you get to act as the main character and to determine what complications or benefits you get, there's a, a die role that helps the game master who's the main narrator of the story we're telling determine what happens next that's pretty that's like the easiest i can i can do yeah that's fair when you actually get the player to sit down because there's actually a lot of times there's the stage before you got to convince them that it's worth trying what i find is game masters should be emphasizing the parts that will make players fall in love with the game. Um, and I say that very specifically because a lot of times what I found is game masters who are invested in the hobby, what they find exciting is not necessarily what the players are going to find exciting. The amount of freaking conversations I've got into about like, oh, well, this is a three action economy. Oh, this has exploding dice. Oh, man, this has a better character creator and more customizable options. For someone brand new, they have no idea what any of that stuff is what they're going to be excited by is uh, being able to defeat the dragon or being able to save their friend with a healing spell. Like it's finding those emotional moments that they can connect to that will excite them to learn the intricacies of the game. Again, I have to have a martial arts example for this, but uh, if I teach a, a new like eight-year-old, they don't care about learning how to do a kick. 
But what they what does excite them and what makes them want to come back is when I take one of the wave master pads and have them kick it over and then start stacking them. And they're like, oh, it's like a big tower. I get to knock it over. It's a very simple thing. But for a kid that age, it's super exciting to be able to do. So it's figuring out where that excitement is and being able to kind of file away or de-emphasize the parts that are going to clutter that. Uh, I, a little bit tangential, but back in the 90s, uh, one of my first experiences with D&D was watching my uh, stepdad who had a bunch of people over. At least one of them hadn't played D&D before. And just the excitement of having everybody sit down and, and roll up characters, like do things together and just put pencil to paper was that was the fun part. And just like talking about like, oh, like, you know, if, like this spell is like you're taking a, a flaming you know ball and kind of like pushing it around the battlefield and slamming it into people and, and that sort of thing. Uh, or just like the way that they were describing the experience, the things that you you can do. I don't know. I don't know why that memory just um, kind of kicked up, but it's, it's it was just such a cool thing. And and I I mean my my stepdad would read like um, Dragonlance to me uh, every night, or like stuff from the Forgotten Realms, um, and and that's how I got my first you know um, real interaction with uh, with Dungeons and Dragons and just that whole world. And it was all really fascinating to me. So maybe maybe that's part of it is like make make the people excited you know like you're you're saying and sometimes that that excitement i doubt it lives within the mechanics i think it lives within who you will be to loop back this is why i envision three kind of pillars like three big games to funnel people in at first um because you know when i think about nintendo the i think socially successful console that they released was the Wii. And it was the the whole thing is I, I would go to people's houses and their parents and grandparents would be playing with them. And it was really intuitive. As a gamer, I did not like the Wii. <laughs> I thought that I, I didn't, I wasn't really a big fan of the motion controls. I just, the games weren't really deep. But if you're looking for a lighter social thing, just hanging out with friends, like my grandma, she, she didn't care about saving throws. Really, I think she she liked fantasy and saw this as a way to hang out with me and spend time with her family. And let, like you said, um, and I have other friends that will come in and they'll be like, well, I've played this video game like The Witcher or I don't know, some tactical game. They really are more interested in the crunchier experience. So maybe Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder would be more interesting for them. So that way if there's more than one big option, you can kind of choose what's going to be the most appropriate. Yeah, for sure. So this is part of the presentation of the game master, but helping the new players be able to then speak to other new players in an approachable way. So part of it is you start with the community that's already invested, but I found uh, running the martial arts school that a lot of times we get a lot of new students when you get one person start as like a white belt. And then within a few classes, they get a friend or two to start with them. And it creates this kind of social bubble that they move up through the ranks with. And it kind of compounds off of that. So it's always a lot easier to get a second or third student to start up if they're friends with one of the first. So when you're thinking about creating a resilient hobby, part of it isn't all right, let me get this new player in. Let me get them really invested. Let me have them get really knowledgeable about everything and then talk to their friends. You actually want to get it a little bit earlier than that. As soon as they fall in love, they you want to you want them to be equipped with the tools to be able to talk with other people to help them fall in love really quick. Yeah, and, and part of that's just the excitement. Make them excited to tell their friends. Oh, and then just from there, uh, just to just summarize the, the last step, it's just the more players you have, the easier it'll be to create custom experiences with them, which naturally leads to things like homebrew. And the more you're homebrewing and the more you're designing, the easier it is to m make something that's commercially viable. And I, I really do, especially it's been a privilege watching you make Distal because there's a lot of behind the screens, like what is it? 
actually like to create a commercial product that you wouldn't think about, you know, the importance of art, the importance of budgeting, how you form a backer kit, your copy and your email messaging. Like the, the thing about artistry is like art only stands the test of time. If you also have someone that's like a good business person behind it, which is the part that like disgusts a lot of artists. And at the end of the day, that's how your art doesn't get lost. So as martial artists, my, my mentor, one of the things he said is he, when he was expanding his martial arts business that I now run, he, he would say, I don't listen to other martial arts school owners. I listen to business people and I'm actually able to do more art because I've got more revenue. <laughs> so we have more students to teach. So the business side is a relevant element of it, even if it's not what excites most people about it. That is something that I've constantly struggled with because it, as a creative, you have to have an eye open for opportunities to to make money or else you won't be, you won't be creating for long. Um, or unless you're just creating for yourself, which is fine too. But if there is a any sort of path to, uh, you know, sharing that or selling your your work with other people, you you can't just uh, keep doing what you love. There also needs to be another um, more business minded element uh, attached to it. It's so frustrating because that's not the part that we care about. We just want to make amazing things. In that vein, I just here's a, a just a quick sort of aside about um, the commercial creation of a game. Um, I, I know I harp on this a lot, but just like don't do what I'm doing. Start small. Just create small uh, things. Put them up on itch.io, which is a website where you can you can sell things for free, and a lot of people get TTRPGs from uh, there in the first place. And um, and try to keep building your community by every person that you get excited by your, by the thing that you're creating, try to keep that person interested. And which also means, you know, maybe having a newsletter so that you can give them an avenue to connect with you. Uh, YouTube is not the place to do that anymore. I know I'm getting really off the rails. Um, social media in general, because you, you can't connect to people the same way that you, you used to. Uh, unless they, unless they put the little bell icon on, on YouTube, which is something that you tend to have to we don't ask for it, but like you can, you can do that. And it's one of those things like, okay, actually just a, <laughs> another, so YouTube in particular, I always waited till like the end of a video to, you know, give a spiel like, yeah, if this video has been interesting, helpful or entertaining, please feel free to like subscribe, whatever, whatever. And tell your friends about the channel. Um, and that is not, that doesn't actually serve the goal of retaining subscribers because they've already clicked off of the video. Um, at, at that point, and you're only going to get like the first, you know, 30 to, to 90 seconds of, of viewership anyway. So I would be more successful would if I were to resort to tactics like that. Similar thing for as much as I loathe it, clickbait thumbnails. The reason that people click on them is because it's, it's interesting. Um, I used to think that I, I don't know. I, I used to think that you just had to be baited into, to seeing those things. But that's not the case. Like you can very clearly see like, oh, okay, it's, you know, this is a, a hyperbolic statement um, or this is like, obviously the answer is no. You know, it's like, is this the D&D &D killer? No, it's not the D&D &D killer. N never is. Um, it never will be. And, but people do that to, to get, you know, views, obviously. And I hate that it works. However, if your avenue for creating or for providing value to people is contingent on first having an open funnel to pull people into the, the product, then maybe that is an avenue. Yeah. I'm sorry, I want to vomit in my mouth is, is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, yeah. So in the martial arts school, um, one of the things that I was trained on is pace, pace, lead, which means without judgment, figure out where someone is at and then gently start to lead them to where you want them to go. So as much as we may disdain clickbait thumbnails, if that's what gets someone in the door, well, now you have now that they're in the door, you can start to transform their life. 
getting them in the door is the hardest thing. It, nobody doesn't matter how amazing our martial arts lessons are if we've got no signage and nobody knows to get there. So it, it, it's not we we may wish for a more ideal circumstance, but there also has to be kind of a reconciliation of that's kind of how things are. But that doesn't mean that's where they have to stay. So if you start with a clickbait thumbnail and then you start to slowly unveil the depth that we have to offer, um, now was the little bit of clickbait thumbnail worth the transformation that occurred in the person who's watching the video or listening to the podcast or reading the book? Man, this ends justify the means thing is it's like a it's a conversation as old as time. I I will not advocate strongly for for doing clickbait stuff. I hate it. I hate that I even think about trying to like ride the line because I I don't you know, I don't want to. I certainly don't want to be deceptive in anything that we we ever talk about. And I almost like lengthen the um, some of the actual uh, titles of videos and stuff too to deliberately stay away from that just habit that people have. But when you think about it logically, people have limited amount of time, limited amount of attention. Um, there's only so many things that they're going to be uh, clicking on when they see like a full spread. If something is more attractive, they're going to click on that one instead of yours. So we're, we're in this like constant state of competition. And that's part of the reason why I say that try to hold on to the, the, uh, the community that you do have and try to get them, uh, I guess, roped into something that is like a more consistent method of communication via a newsletter or or some other method you know a discord is probably fine too i don't know a lot of people are subscribed to many many discords and tend to um, avoid the notifications anyway but it's finding ways to connect with people is going to be one of the biggest challenges that you'll have for any sort of commercial product it's also why uh, people who are creating third-party content for um, for Dungeons and Dragons, like they'll put their stuff up on Drive Through RPG, and um, and sometimes it'll do really well. Sometimes it'll suck, and it, like not do well. Sometimes it'll do better on on itch. They're they're trying to find an open funnel, but you're also competing with a lot of different um, things at the same time. So build reliability, which does mean that you do have to have some sort of marketing side of you despite being the creative that you are. Well, and that that's why, really, that's the heart of why I find so much value in finding ways to make what we're doing approachable and easy to talk about. Um, our martial arts school, like, to go to, back to the clickbait thingy, um, we don't really do a lot of, like, traditional marketing where we have, like, newspaper ads or uh, even Facebook. Like, where we, we occasionally will do something like that. Where we find success in is when a parent goes to another parent friend and says, oh, my gosh, this changed my kid's life. And they're able to talk about, you know, how we teach them respect, self-control, self-discipline. We have very easily packaged ideas that are easy to talk about. And like we both just demonstrated, TTRPGs struggle with that a little bit. <laughs> a lot of it is very high minded and abstract. And just to get someone in the door you kind of need to figure out a way that makes it approachable and easy to talk about. Even if the game is a niche, like the mechanics satisfy a certain specific audience, the concept of sitting down and rolling dice, like that part of it is kind of the same across TTRPGs. So it the more the easier it is for your players to talk about how amazing your game is, the easier it'll be for the community to build on itself so that you don't have to resort to the clickbait or other methods that you don't like as much. So if, you, if you've if you already gotten a community or a, a path to, to get there, what would be the, the next step in helping kind of build the resiliency of, I guess, our industry? I, I think it like loops back to the first step. So, for example, in our martial arts school, if we have a boom of new students, we not only want to retain them, we actually want to train them to be instructors. And not all of them, are, most of them are not going to get to that step. But we want to have very clear, low friction pathways. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not hard work involved, but we, we want them to be able to determine for themselves very clearly. Um is this something that I would enjoy doing and I would find value out of? 
Um, so now that you have more game masters and more leaders and more instructors, well, now you can start doing more complicated events. You can start running, you know, bigger things. And as more students come in, it's easier for them to feel like they belong and that they can also uh, hit the different levels to whatever is going to be appropriate to them. Our, our school has always been healthiest when it's not, you know, one head instructor and then a bunch of helper instructors and then a bunch of students. If there's different levels of commitment, you have a head instructor just to run admin and marketing. Um, and then you've got some really competent instructors, then some helper instructors, then some kid instructors so that the kids can see the ladder that they can climb. Yeah, part of me feels like we've gotten a little bit distracted from uh, or maybe abstracted from the concept of uh, bolstering our, our industry. I think one of the ways that we as an individual, a person can do that is to be invested in our communities as well to celebrate the successes of those who are also making amazing things you know be it i mean like you know dc20 or mcdm or um you know shadow dark and all those those titles that have very obviously shown success but also the smaller creators the people that you don't know about the people that uh, are kind of in a place that you that you might end up even so like if you want to create a, you know, a small uh, or like a, a product at some point, like that's, you know, go on to, to Backerkit or, or like even just look around on, on Twitter. People are always talking if you're in the, if you're in the right space and have um, that being fed to you on Twitter, people are creating something new all the time and it can be very difficult to find exposure. So one of the ways that we can do that is to be that person who is, you know, chiming in on, on smaller YouTube channels even, and just being excited, excited and supportive of other people's work. I know that your time is limited and a lot of times it doesn't necessarily take that much to, you know, drop a comment, to, to watch a video, to have something up in the background. And, uh, and I think that those sorts of activities when done with, um, with sort of like an altruistic mind, will eventually help propel your success um, if you do pursue commercial efforts. But we're all kind of in this together. Absolutely. I mean, the biggest evidence of the fact that this community has the potential to be powerful enough to revolutionize this industry is, again, the 2023 OGL thing. Like that, that <laughs> the fact that so many people so quickly were able to organize their efforts um, really proved that the it can happen, right? Now, the other thing about industry is it can sometimes move slow, which is why I guess what I'm advocating for is by thinking about these things and investing ahead of time, not waiting for D&D &D to collapse and then trying to react to it by filling the vacuum. Um, so, uh, and just to loop back to it, like I said earlier, the reason it's so beneficial to foster a new generation of GMs and have more players convert to also being GMs. GMs are the ones who buy things. So if you're going to support smaller creators, it's more likely those smaller creators get supported if you have more GMs that will jive with their product. So really, it, that's why it starts with the people that are already invested in the community, convert them, and then that's where you can start to build off of the momentum of, of them, you know, stepping into being leaders at their own table. You know, what's kind of interesting, um, just as, as you were going through that, I was thinking that third party creators um, who are currently working in the space of D&D, &D, like you don't necessarily need to, to live only there. You can be creating content for Shadow Dark and other systems that are smaller scale, if time permits. But I, I have seen a number of uh, creators recently do, do content for both 5e because it makes the money and also this other system over here at the same time because it's similar enough or the conversion won't be that bad to to pull off and i, I feel like that seems to be i mean that's, that's like a win-win strategy again if you have the time because uh, even getting to reuse the same art that you're doing for for one book and in, in another book it sounds like you're multiplying your efforts so consider that as well if you're uh if you're in that space cool all right well Hopefully you found something uh, of value from our, uh, our long discussion here. 
If this video has been interesting, helpful, or entertaining, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. That. <laughs> all right. That was, that was all like over the place, that. dude. It I was all over the it. place. I don't care. Yeah. I liked it. Well, okay. Good.